meaningful and thought-provoking song this morning. If you have your uh, copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. We are studying uh, through the book of Matthew, and hopefully uh, by the time you finish chapter 24, your eyes will not have glazed over and rolled back in your head. This is not easy stuff. It's not light stuff. But it's stuff that Jesus thought was important for us to know. It's, it's about uh, uh, the end of times, as it were, and all that is surrounding that. And there's a lot of controversy and there's a lot of confusion. We established some of that. Uh, if, if we had a dollar for every person who's made a prediction about end times events or who's written a book about end times events, look, we could have some really nice facilities around here, all right? It would be amazing to think about how many uh, gallons of ink have been spilled over this one particular subject. And I, I just... From a personal perspective, as a young man, a young married man, God used the subject of end times to put a hook in my heart and draw me to himself. I don't really see things exactly like I saw them back then, and I, I've, I've been trained, and I've studied, and I've prayed a lot about that, but, but I just want to say that, that God really used this subject matter to draw me closer to himself, and really uh, began to, to establish a real personal relationship with him, and so I, I hope maybe that, that some of this, as we talk about it, will do for you what it did for me. Let me start with the story, and then I'll jump into some scripture this morning. It's been uh, several years ago that uh, I felt, and Christy felt, as we prayed together, that the Lord would have me go back to school, uh, which means go back and suffer for Jesus. Amen? Okay. That's what I was doing. And so uh, I, I, I started uh, the process of, of getting my uh, uh, doctorate there in New Orleans uh, Seminary. And uh, they have little mini seminar sessions. If you're a doctoral student, you serve somewhere and you drive in for three or four days on campus. And, and to be honest with you, I've not driven that often in New Orleans. And the streets are not always marked at least as clearly as I need them to be. And I'll never forget, uh, one day, I'm crossing an intersection uh, down near uh, Gentilly Boulevard in, in the area of the seminary there, and, and I cross that intersection, and I see what looked like a homeless guy. If he wasn't a homeless guy, uh, he, he sure did miss a good opportunity to be a homeless guy. And, and this homeless guy, which I thought he was a homeless guy, I'm not sure, but he had his shirt off, okay? And he took his shirt and he was slinging it around and around and around. And he was pointing his finger at me. And I thought, man, this place really is crazy. <laughs> and I got to looking around. And you know what I figured out? That that guy who really looked crazy wasn't near as crazy as I thought he was. Because I was driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and he was doing his very best to warn this crazy country bumpkin from Rehoboth, Alabama, that I needed to get off the course that I was on. This morning, I want to tell you something. In the last week of Jesus' life, on that Tuesday, Jesus walks out of the temple for the last time. As Ezekiel talks about a day when the glory of the Lord would depart the temple. And on that day, the glory walked out. The temple was nothing more than a shell, for the glory had departed. The glory hiked up the eastern mountain there. And that glory would never shine in that temple again. Jesus looks at those hard-headed religious folks, and he preaches 
uh, just a, a very challenging message to them. And then he laments over them. Listen, I just want you to listen to Matthew 23, 37, uh, or actually 35. Listen to what, what that says. So that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berkiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And that's the words that he left the temple with. And he walks out of the temple on that Tuesday. And he walks up the Mount of Olives. And he weeps over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And the setting is really powerful. I want you to know that oftentimes what we do is we decouple Matthew 24 and Matthew 23. And when we try to interpret Matthew 24, we try to make it stand alone. And we forget the context that Jesus had just decried against the religious hypocrisy that was rampant in Jerusalem. And rampant among the religious leaders. We forget that he has just said that all these things are going to happen to this generation. And somehow we forget the warning of Jesus in the context of that warning. Can I give you just a, a little tip? One of, the, one of the most important things you can do when you handle Scripture is remember the context. Okay? Look at me. My professor taught me this, this uh, kind of phrase. Context is king. And if you kind of decouple the text from the greater context, all you've got is a pretext, and you've missed the point altogether. And so into this context that Jesus pronounces that all the blood of the prophets is going to be returned on the head of the generation that will crucify the Messiah. All that has to be borne in mind as the events of Revelation chapter 24 continue. And so, as they make their way up that that great mountain, the disciples get a glimpse of the glory of the temple, and they say, Jesus... Look at this great building. Look at the glory of this building. And Jesus responds in Matthew 24, verse 2 again. And he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And so the context primarily has to do with what Jesus was predicting to happen no more than 40 years from the time he utters these words. He makes a prediction that the temple is going to close for business and God is going to establish a permanent out-of-order sign over the temple. Now, I've got a picture of, of the temple. This is what the temple looks like now, okay? Do you think Jesus was exaggerating when he said that? (laughs) Folks, you visit that glorious side of the temple and you find that the prophecy of Jesus has been fulfilled in frightening detail. These stones that were so massive and so heavy and so weighty, not one of them remains on the Temple Mount. They've all been raked off and they're piles of rubble just like Jesus promised. Well, this church, this was shocking to the first century apostles. They couldn't believe, they couldn't fathom the fact That the temple would go out of business. And here's what they decided. That the day that the temple is destroyed, the world will end. 
They really believed that the temple would survive to the end of the world. And when the world ended, when the temple ended, the world will end. And so they asked that question as you see it in the text there. Uh, verse number 3 of Matthew 24. Uh, uh, and, and, and they asked this question, basically, I think it's verse number 4, actually. And they asked this uh, question, when are these things going to happen? Tell us, he said, tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So they assumed, they made it a, an assumption that the destruction of the temple would go hand in hand with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, can I tell you, they were just a little bit confused. Are you with me this morning? Just yawn if you are, okay? They were just a little bit confused. So their thinking was, destroy this temple, it brings the end of this present world order. And that's not Jesus preaching and teaching on this subject. Now, if you've got your listener's guide this morning, we're about to uh, kind of dig into that just a little bit. Uh, point A in our outline, point A, the words of Christ are life. The words of Christ are life. Think about this for a minute. As I'm driving down that street... And I hear this man shouting and hollering and pointing at me. What if I had ignored his message? You know what? The end would have been tragic. And this morning I want to tell you something. The message of the Lord Jesus Christ, his word for you and for me, is something we better not ignore. His word is that which brings life to our very lives. And so we see this. The words of Christ are life. In fact, uh, Peter says this in John chapter 6, verse number 68. He says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I, I, I know. We got talk radio. We got talk television. Uh, we got phones that talk to us. We got friends that talk to us. And we're bombarded by a million, billion voices in our culture today. And it's really easy to tune out the noise. But let me tell you and remind you that you and I better not tune out the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because his voice is life. And so you see in this context and remember that Jesus is speaking. It's not the, the prophecy mavens with their great charts. It's not the, 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 the scholars with their study Bibles. It's Jesus and his words that bring life to our lives. And what do they do uh, uh, under, under uh, our, our outline? Uh, small a is this. The words of Christ, they provide protection. The words of Christ provide protection. Look at verses 15 and following. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation. You need to underline that phrase. Such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So let me just summarize what, what Jesus is saying here, okay? 
when you see the abomination prophesied by Daniel the prophet, here's what you need to do. Okay? Uh, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. You ever seen that movie, Forrest Gump? And, 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 and Mama and Jeannie, they always told Forrest when he got in trouble that he needed to do one thing. Do you all remember what he needed to do? Run, Forrest. Okay? Well, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, You remember that prophecy that Daniel had about the desolation that's going to happen in the temple? He said, When you see these things begin to unfold, you need to lean in a little closer. You need to run, okay? That's what he says. You need to make tracks, okay? You don't need to go pack your bags. You don't need to go down to the kitchen and get your fine stuff, and, and you don't even need to go get your coat, okay? You need to go. You need to go in a hurry. You need to go because what? Why? Because something unimaginable is about to happen. And Jesus is warning his disciples of the impending danger that will be faced by Jerusalem in no more than 40 years. He says the prophecy and the prediction about the one who will desolate the temple is going to happen. Now why does Jesus, now just just lean in for a second. Why does Jesus need to tell them to run, okay? Uh, My girls... Like those scary movies. I don't know if y'all like those, but I hate them, okay? Uh, uh, you know, if, if weird things start happening in my house and I hear voices saying, get out, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get out. <laughs> um, that, that's just me. So, so you, you're thinking, as you, as you read this text and you're asking yourself, well, well if Jesus is telling these disciples to get out of town. Why does he need to say that? And here's why, okay? Because the Jewish people are very nationalistic. And they have a tendency to stay and defend their nation at the cost of their own lives. There in that place, And they held off the legions of the Roman army from 66 all the way to 73 A.D. Finally, the Roman army built a siege ramp. And you can see on, the, on my right side, as it were, a little ramp. The Roman army built a siege ramp and breached the walls of Masada. When they got into Masada, you know what they found? Not one Jewish person alive. Men, women, children, all of them died. You think, well, did they starve to death? No, they grew their own food. Did they thirst to death? No, they had this amazing ability to collect rainwater into these massive reservoirs. And they could have lasted decades and decades with the water they had. What killed them? Here's what it was. They turned their knives on themselves. You see, they'd rather die at the hands of a Jewish person than to be slaves to the Romans. And when Jesus says this, he's got this this backdrop of this Jewish mindset, a very tenacious Jewish mindset. If you uh, enter uh, the, uh, the military over in Israel today, which is everybody, men, women, and children, at at, at the age of 18, everybody goes into the military. When you're sworn in, guess where they take you? They take you to this spot right here because it's a source of of pride. It's a source of, uh, of national pride to say, you know what, we will not break. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, guys, don't stand and fight on that day. Run for your lives. Run for your lives. Don't go home and pack. Don't go get your things together. Don't put your house in order. Run for the mountains as quickly as you can because there's going to be great tribulation such as the world has never, ever experienced. So in April, 
right after the Passover, 70 AD, the Romans began to encircle Jerusalem, okay? And that, friend, that was a marker in the life of the followers of Jesus Christ. They were made aware of the reality that this indicated that the desolation was near. As the Romans began to encircle Jerusalem, the Christians got word of this. They took note of the words of Christ and they took action. And we'll deal with that in just a minute. But I want you to understand the atrocities that are going to happen here in Jerusalem. Josephus, the Jewish historian, he tells us that as as Rome tried to get the Jewish people to surrender, they would catch those who would escape the city. You know what they would do with them? They would crucify them. Roman soldiers got word that some of these Jewish people were actually taking their valuables and ingesting them. And the Roman soldiers were cutting the Jewish people open in order to maybe try to reclaim some of that wealth. It was unbelievable. The the stories are striking. In fact, Josephus tells us that the number of crucifixions grew to such an extent that daily Rome was crucifying 500 Jewish people a day. Just just listen to uh, to, to what uh, I believe it's Josephus says. Listen to what his, his comments on this were. He says this, So great was their number, talking about those being crucified, so great was their number that space could not be found for the crosses, nor crosses for the bodies. This was a picture of utter and complete devastation. When you looked outside that city, the city was literally surrounded by crosses and those who were being crucified. And you say, man, that's as bad as it could get. Well, I'll tell you something. It gets worse than that. As the days go by in Jerusalem, as time ticks away, the food begins to run out. Church, you know what a hungry man will do? Nearly anything. And as hunger arose in the city, and as desperation took hold and gripped that city, that climate drove the people to a breaking point. Josephus, who is not a Christian, but a Jewish historian who observed all this as a captive of the Roman armies, he documents all these things very carefully. And he talks about a lady in particular, a well-to-do lady in Jewish life. She had come for the Passover, got caught by the Roman armies, and was stuck there. And as hunger grew and as desperation grew, she had no hope. This is what Josephus says that she does. Listen to this. This is shocking. As soon as she had said this, she slew her son, her infant son, and then roasted him and ate the one half of him and kept the other half by her concealed. As you think about the atrocities that surrounded 70 AD, never before and never again has the world ever sniffed anything like this. And Jesus said, when you see these things begin to unfold, you don't go down to your house and put your stuff in order. You need to go. You need to run for your Lives, Because Jesus, listen to me now, because Jesus cares about your safety. Did you know that? You could say amen to that. When my family uh, takes a trip every once in a while, uh, we'll go someplace. And before we pull out of the driveway, typically, my wife is prompting me. And she'll say, hey, Dad, you, you want to pray for us? And, and so I will, like, Lord, 
keep us safe as we go down to see Mickey Mouse, you know, and as we do the, <laughs> all the things down there. And I feel a little bit silly about asking a prayer as we go on vacation to, to some fun place. But as I think about it, when Jesus said and talks to his people, one of the things that he really cares about, he doesn't just care about their spiritual well-being and their spiritual health. But you know that Jesus cares about your physical well-being and your physical health. And the reason he tells these people to go and to run and to get away is because he cares for their physical well-being. He tells them to get out of Dodge because he cares. Jesus cares about the safety of his people. In fact, in, in Luke chapter 21, verse number 20, Jesus, get, this, is a, this is a parallel passage now. And Jesus says this, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Jesus said that's the cue to get out of Dodge before everything hits. Run, don't pack, don't get your coat, don't put your house in order. Make sure on that day that you get safely away. Now, we started with a premise that Jesus' words are life. And they're life when we act upon them okay here's here's what i i find myself very comfortable doing okay i love to listen to good preaching okay i know you would love to listen to good preaching if you could only hear some but but i love it i i i listen to it in my car i listen to it in my office i love to hear someone break open the word and if i'm not careful Good preaching for me becomes almost a form of entertainment. Like going to the movies or watching your favorite TV show or, or, or watching a sports competition. And if I'm not careful, the tendency is to, to, to just translate the Word of God into a form of personal entertainment. But can I tell you and remind you that the Scripture is not there just to entertain you. The scripture is there to engage you and me personally so that it changes us and makes us who God wants us to be. And how does that happen? And Here it is, church. It happens when we personally apply the word of God. When you say yes to God's word and apply it to your life, things happen. Well, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, and the other disciples that stood on that mountainside and heard Jesus' denunciation of Jerusalem, they took notes and they said, you know what? Jesus says when these things happen, we better get out of Dodge. You know what the Christians did? Get this. This is crazy. Try this on for a second. You know what the Christians did? They Listen to Jesus. Jewish historian Eusebius writes about the events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem. And I've got a quote here in this text. They listen to the words. Listen to what Eusebius said. But the people of the church in Jerusalem had been commanded by a revelation to leave the city and to dwell in certain town in Perea called Pella. And when those that believed in Christ had come from Jerusalem, then, as if the royal city of the Jews and the whole land of Judea were entirely destitute of holy men, the judgment of God at length overtook those who had committed such outrages against Christ and his apostles and totally destroyed that generation of M pious men. What does that mean, church? Is that Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and the other disciples, they took the words of Christ seriously, and it protected their lives. I grew up with uh, 
with a cousin of mine. He was more a country boy than I was, okay? He had, he had goats at his house. Uh, he had other farm animals such as cats and things like that. And uh, I think at one point he even had a bull. And the thing that I remember most about his outside living space is that these, these kind of animals and creatures, they were all fenced in with this wire that I was told that I didn't ever want to touch, okay? And, 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 and over and over again, that, 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 that lesson is beat into my brain. Don't touch that wire. Don't touch that wire. Well, you know what? Curiosity often kills the cat, right? And one day, what I did was I extended my hand. I said, what is the big deal about this wire? And when I laid hold of that wire, I really found out what the big deal was about that wire. When when my family said don't, what they were saying is this, don't hurt yourself. Listen to me. When Jesus gives us instructions in life, It is for our good, spiritually and oftentimes physically. And the church listened. When Jesus said judgment is coming to this generation, when they saw the Roman armies, they didn't hesitate. They got out of Dodge. And they were protected by the grace of God. And so you see all this unfolding. And so the words of Jesus provide protection and they provide direction. And Jesus says it very clearly in verses 23 and following. If anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. So if you say to, if they say to you, look, here is the in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east, and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, the vultures will be gathered. And and, and so what you're seeing here is this, is that Jesus is providing direction. Because you and I, in times of desperation, could have a tendency to grab hold and own to wrong things, and to trust in things that are not reliable. And Jesus said, a lot of people are going to be saying, well, there's Messiah, and there's Messiah in difficult days. And Jesus says, don't believe it. If you read the uh, epistle that Paul writes to uh, the the church at Thessalonica, chapter 2, or I should say, uh, the second uh, book of Thessalonians, Paul writes and he addresses an issue that had really rocked the foundation of that church. Someone had picked up a pen and paper and said, guess what? Jesus returned and you missed it. And they signed Paul's name to it. And it rocked the foundation of that church. Because they thought Jesus came in secret and didn't tell anybody. And they missed the whole shebang. Okay? (laughs) Uh, Have you ever done that? I grew up in in a kind of a very strict evangelical upbringing, and you know we talked about end time events. And there were times when I would come home, and people who were sh- or should have been there weren't there. And you know what I immediately assumed? The rapture happened, and I've been left behind. And I, you know, I, I just always had this imagination that this secret event is going to happen, and I'm going to miss it. And you know what Jesus says? He says the coming of the Lord is not like that. It's not a closed door kind of a thing. It's a kind of thing that every eye sees, that every ear hears, that it's unmistakable. Look at the analogies that he gives. Look look back uh, in verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, You know what Jesus says? You don't have to be in the east to see a lightning strike. You can be on the other side and it's still visible. 
and it's still unmistakable. Or, here's his second one. Wherever the corpse is, the vultures will gather. Think about this. You're, you're driving around, and you see vultures overhead. What does that tell you? Something died, right? You may not see that. But you know unmistakably, there's a visual that it's unmistakable that it's real. Listen to me. Look at this. Look at this way, okay? There's coming a day when every eye will see, where every knee will bow, where no one will miss the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am completely out of time, and so we got to wrap it up. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? I'll try to finish this up. Maybe next week, because there's a lot more to be said about this. But I want to bore in on an application for us personally. And that's this. Is that the word of Jesus Christ is life to you. And maybe some of you, maybe some of us, have been so bombarded with noise, with racket, and with distractions that we have turned His voice down and we have tuned it out and we have failed to listen to the One who gives life. This morning, my hope and my trust is this, is that you wouldn't give your attention to Oprah or to Dr. Phil or to the latest self-help book, but that your mind would be saturated with the word of the living Lord Jesus Christ, the one who embodies truth and life. Friend, I believe that Jesus desires you to tune your ear to him and listen and obey. Father God, in the sanctuary this morning, I pray that you would fill us with an appetite to be hearers and doers of the word. May we tune in, tune out the noise, and tune into Jesus. God, I pray that you would use this time of invitation as a time to galvanize us once again around the truths of Scripture. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? This altar is going to be open. And I'm just going to invite you as a time for you to personally respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to come down here and get on your face on this altar and say, Lord, I've tuned out your voice one too many times, and I want to hear you speak to me, Lord. However, in whatever way God is speaking to your heart, I would invite you to respond as we sing.